वेलकम बैक लिस्नर्स दिस इज द सेकेंड पार्ट ऑफ द सस्पेंस स्टोरी ब्रिस्टल मर्डर एट द एंड ऑफ पार्ट वन यू लिसन अ पुलिस मैन स्टॉप्ड पीटर ऑन रोड लेट्स कंटिन्यू फ्रॉम देयर द पुलिस मैन हेल्ड इज हैंड अप पीटर स्लोड द लॉरी डाउन एंड स्टॉप्ड द पुलिस मैन वॉकड अप टू द साइड विंडो What is it? asked Peter. What is the matter? We are looking for a boy who think may have killed his uncle, replied the policeman. Oh yeah, said Peter. I heard the news about it on the radio this morning. Well, continued the policeman. We think the boy has left Bristol and he may be hitchhiking north. Is he dangerous? asked Peter. Very dangerous. He killed his uncle with a chair leg. The policeman added. What does he look like? Asked Peter. The policeman took out his notebook and read. John Stevens, aged sixteen, brown hair, brown eyes, average height. Last seen wearing a red jersey and blue jeans. The policeman looked up from his notebook. Have you seen him? He asked Peter. Yes, said Peter. I've seen hundreds of young men dressed like that this morning. It could have been any of them. Okay, said the policeman. Thanks for your help. If you do see him, let us know, won't you? Of course, replied Peter and started the engine. Cheerio, shouted the policeman. That means have a good day or goodbye with cheer. Cheer, cheer up. So, okay the policeman said thanks for your help if you do see him let us know one you of course replied peter and started the engine shirio shouted the policeman just a minute said another voice the policeman turned around another policeman was getting out of the police car he was a big and red faced and had a nasty voice what is it now asked peter I've got to be in Manchester before five o'clock. All right, this won't take long," said the second policeman. "We are going to search your lorry." "Why?" asked Peter, angrily. "The boy may be hiding there." Both policemen walked around to the back of the lorry. "What shall I do now?" thought Peter. "I could drive off before they look in the back, but if I do drive away, they'll drive after me, and their car is much faster than my lorry." What shall I do? Sit here and wait. If they find John, I can say that I didn't know he was in my lorry. Hey you! shouted one of the policemen. They found him, thought Peter. Hey you! Come and help us open the back of your lorry. Right, shouted Peter and got out. If I'm there when they find John, he thought, perhaps I can give him a chance to escape by getting in the policeman's way. Peter walked around to the back of the lorry and opened it for the policemen. They looked in. All they could see was a lot of boxes in one corner, some old coats on the floor. "Right," said the second policeman. "I'm sorry to have made you wait so long. You can go now." Peter thanked him, got into the lorry and drove off. He drove for 10 minutes until he was sure that the police car was not following him. then he stopped jumped out and ran around to the back of the lorry he opened it and looked in he couldn't see john anywhere peter climbed into the back he couldn't understand where john was the old coat was there but john wasn't lying on it then peter saw something that the police hadn't noticed He could see part of a shoe sticking out from under the coat. Peter smiled when he thought how stupid the police were not to have looked under the coat. He went up to the coat and said loudly, "This is the police. Come out at once. We know you are under the coat." "All right," said a voice from under the coat, and John slowly got up. "Oh, it's you," said John. I thought you were the police. Now, replied Peter, I was just playing a joke on you. You did frighten me, said John. I had a strange dream when I was asleep. What? exclaimed Peter.
Have you been asleep all the time? Yes, I dreamed the police were searching the lorry. That wasn't a dream, replied Peter. It was real. You mean that the police stopped the lorry when I was asleep? Asked John. Peter nodded. Nodded means moved his head to say yes. Peter nodded his head. Yeah, he said. And you didn't tell them where I was? Asked John. No, said Peter. But why did you help me? Asked John. You could have got into trouble yourself. Because I don't think you did what the police said, answered Peter. What has my uncle told them? Asked John. Your uncle hasn't told them anything. Well, in that case, said John, because his dad, said Peter, quietly. Oh no, cried John. I didn't hit him very hard. If you hit someone with a chair leg, continued Peter, you don't have to hit them very hard to kill them. A chair leg? replied John in surprise. I didn't hit him with a chair leg. I hit him with my hands. Peter took the newspaper out of his pocket and showed John the article about the murder. Are you sure? asked Peter. Yes, said John firmly. Then I was right not to tell the police about you, said Peter. We'd better start again now or else we'll never get to Manchester or find out who killed your uncle. By five o'clock, Peter and John were outside Manchester. Have you ever been here before? asked Peter. No, I haven't, said John. Well, this is what we'll do. I have to take my load of biscuits to this address. He gave John a piece of paper. It will take me an hour or two to unload everything and then I'm going to go and see some friends. Why are you going to go and see some friends? asked John. I thought you were going to help me find out who killed my uncle. I'm going to, replied Peter. When I was younger, I had a lot of friends in Bristol. We used to meet a lot and sometimes we did stupid things. What do you mean stupid things? John didn't understand. Oh, fighting, breaking windows, borrowing cars, explained Peter. John interrupted, borrowing cars? Peter smiled. Well, taking them for an evening, driving around and then leaving them. It means stealing the car, using them and leave them somewhere. Did you do that? asked John, looking surprised. We had nothing else to do, Peter continued. It was fun for a time. Not for the people whose cars you took, John added. That's true, Peter agreed. Anyway, after a while, I stopped seeing those friends. Why? asked John. Because they started stealing cars and selling them explained Peter. John nodded his head. I understand. Peter went on. Soon after that they were caught by the police. What did the police do? asked John. They sent my friends to prison, said Peter. John looked at Peter. I'm sure that stopped them stealing. Not really, said Peter, shaking his head, because in prison they met older men who taught them a lot about stealing. What happened? When they left prison, inquired John. They came to live in Manchester, answered Peter. And I'm afraid that they've continued to steal things. But how does this help me? asked John. When I've finished uploading the lorry, I'm going to try to find some of those old friends, said Peter. As they've been in prison, they know lots of criminals, lots of people who make a living by stealing. Criminals always talk to each other about things like your uncle's murder. My friends may have heard something about it, something which the police may not know. John smiled. I understand now, he said. They may be able to tell us something useful, something to help us find out who killed my uncle. Peter stopped the lorry outside the shop where he was going to upload the biscuits. Right, said Peter. Look, we are here now. Why don't you go to a cafe or to the cinema? The police won't be looking for you in Manchester. I'll meet you here outside the shop at 10 o'clock. Can't I come with you? asked John. No, Peter replied. My friends might not want to talk in front of you because they don't know you. Okay, said John. 
See you at 10 o'clock. Thanks so much for all your help. You can thank me after we found the murderer, said Peter. Peter and John jumped out of the lorry. John walked off down the street and Peter went into the shop where he had to unload the biscuits. He helped the man from the shop to carry the biscuits into the back of the shop and counted all the boxes. Then he got the manager to sign the papers to show that the shop had received all the boxes. By this time, it was half past six. Peter knew he had to hurry if he was going to help John. He parked the lorry on a piece of open ground and started walking. He walked quickly with his hands in his pockets and had soon left the shopping streets behind him. It was already getting dark and the street lights were on. Peter crossed a busy main road and continued walking as fast as he could. The houses here were smaller and older. The roads were narrower and children were playing under the street lights. Here and there, Peter could see small areas of open ground covered with broken bottles, old cars and empty tents. Peter hurried on and soon came to a cafe on the corner of one of the streets. The sign outside said, Cozy Cafe. Peter looked in the window and then went in. He asked for a cup of tea and sat down. The cafe was almost empty. An old man sat in one corner reading a newspaper. At the next table to Peter sat a man of about 25 smoking a cigarette. Peter drank some tea and then went over to talk to the owner of the cafe who was washing up dirty cups and saucers. Good evening, said Peter. Yes, the cafe owner replied. What can I do for you? I'm looking for an old friend, said Peter. He used to live near here. Oh yeah, I might know him, said the cafe owner without looking up from his washing up. What's his name? Jeff. Jeff Beck, said Peter quickly. The cafe owner dropped the cup he was holding. It broke on the floor. No, mister, said the cafe owner. I don't know anyone of that name. You must have made a mistake. Are you sure? asked Peter, going up close to the cafe owner. I think you do know him. Look, I said, I didn't know. I don't like people asking questions. Why don't you go and ask someone else? The cafe owner shouted. Go on, get out. Okay, said Peter. Thank you for your help. Peter left the cafe and started to walk along the street. Excuse me, can you tell me the time? said a voice from the behind. Peter turned round. It was the man who had been sitting next to him in the cafe. Of course, said Peter and looked at his watch. As he did so, the man got hold of Peter's hair and twisted his head back. Peter felt the cold steel of a knife against his throat. Now we are going to see whether you really do know Jeff or whether you are from the police. The man said, here we see that Peter himself in the grip, Peter himself is in the grip of the criminals. How Peter will come out? Well, we leave Peter with the criminal for a while and let's go back with John, where John is. When John got out of the lorry, he watched Peter go into the shop. Then John started to walk slowly along the pavement. He had never been to Manchester before and he didn't know where to go or what to do. People pushed past him as they hurried home from work. Everyone had somewhere to go or something to do except him. He started looking in the shop windows so that people wouldn't see that he was lonely. After a while, he came to a cinema. Jean went up to the cinema and looked at the photographs outside. There was a 
cowboy film showing john noticed that there were other people standing looking at the photographs if i stand here he thought no one will notice me they'll think i'm waiting to go to the cinema or to meet someone soon he had looked at all the photographs several times so he stood watching the people go past there were several other people standing outside the cinema as well a man wearing a suit who kept on looking at his watch a small group of girls who were laughing together a girl of about 16 who seemed worried about something a mother two small children and lots of parcels two boys of about john's age smoking cigarettes and trying to look very grown up and an old man with a long coat these all were the people who were outside the cinema more people came and waited for a while and then went into the cinema a small fat man came hurrying up to the woman with the children kissed her and picked up one of the children the woman picked up the other child and with parcels and children in their arms they rushed off together the group of girls finally decided to go into the cinema a taxi stopped and a pretty girl came running up to the man in the suit who had been looking at his watch she said she was sorry she was late and they went off happily together in the taxi the two boys put out their cigarettes and went into the cinema the old man walked off down the street slowly looking in all the shop windows the only people left waiting outside the cinema were john and the girl who was looking for it john looked at the clock outside the cinema and trends it was 7:30 The film had started at 7:15. John looked at the girl. She was thin, quite tall and had short brown hair. She looked about the same age as John. She was walking up and down with an angry look on her face. She looks quite nice, thought John. I wonder what she would do if I asked her to go to the cinema with me. I expect she is waiting for someone but she has been waiting for a long time now perhaps the person she is waiting for isn't going to come shall i go and ask her to go into the cinema with me what if she laughs at me what if she calls a policeman as he was thinking this john looked up to the, his surprise he saw that the girl was not the only other person there there was a man standing outside the cinema as well guess who was that other man standing outside the cinema ah police man john stood quite still he wasn't sure what to do if he walked away perhaps the policeman would stop him and ask him questions if he stood there perhaps the policeman would ask him why he was waiting the policeman looked at john john looked away and pretended to look at the photographs after a minute john looked back at the policeman he was still staring at him then the policeman started to walk towards him well john thought there is only one thing to do now i must talk to the girl so that the policeman will think i live here john walked up to the girl and said hello Hello said the girl in reply there was a silence do you want to go in and see the film with me john asked suddenly I, I, i don't know the girl replied looking surprised i'm waiting for my boyfriend but i've been waiting for half an hour an hour and he hasn't come yet perhaps he won't come said john quickly perhaps he has taken another girl to the cinema instead the girl smiled well if he has done that she said i'll come in with you but he may just be late and he'll be angry if he gets here and doesn't find me the policeman came closer john took hold of the girl's hand come on he said to her the film's already started 
All right then, the girl replied, but I hope Steve doesn't get angry. Who's Steve? asked John. My boyfriend, she replied as they went up to buy tickets. Oh, don't worry about him, said John, feeling very happy because he had escaped from the policeman. Your boyfriend will never know you went into the cinema with me. Will he? John turned to the ticket office and asked for two seats at the back. That's six pounds sixty, please, said the woman selling the tickets. John gave her the money. What's your name? He asked, turning to the girl. Suzanne, she replied. What's your name? John, he said with a smile. He took her hand and they went into the cinema together. The film had already started and it was dark inside. They found two seats at the back and sat down. Suzanne squeezed John's hand. I like you, she said to him. You're nice. Well, listeners, here let's leave these two, the couple, in the cinema watching the film and let's go back to the scene where the criminal or the young man had caught hold of Peter and pushed a knife against his throat. The man holding the knife pushed Peter and said, Come on. All right, said Peter, I'll go with you. Jeff's a friend of mine and he'll be angry with you if he hurt me. Come on then, repeated the man, let's go. They walked along the dark street. The man with the knife walked just behind Peter. At the corner, a big car was parked. Stop here, the man said and opened the door of the car. Get in. Don't try to escape or do anything stupid. The man started the engine and drove very fast through the narrow, dark streets. After only five minutes, the car stopped outside a big house. There was a sign outside the house which said Cabaret Club. Cabaret Club. There were lots of cars parked in front of the house. Get out, said the man. Peter got out of the car and stood on the pavement. This way, said the man, pushing Peter towards the front door. Peter could hear music coming from the house. The man rang the bell and a little window in the door opened. A man's face opened in the window. What do you want? asked the face. It's me, said the man from the cafe. I brought someone who says that he's a friend of Jeff. Jeff's in the back room. The man at the door replied and opened the door to let them in. The man from the cafe took Peter through the hall and stopped outside the door at the end of the corridor. Peter looked around. The rooms on each side of the hall were full of people drinking, talking and playing cards. The man with Peter knocked at the door and pushed Peter into the room. It was a small room full of smoke. Three men were sitting around a table playing cards. One of the men turned around and looked at Peter. It was Jeff. Well, look who has come to visit us, Jeff said in a surprised voice. Then Jeff turned to the man who had brought Peter from the cafe and asked, why did you bring Peter here? Well, boss, the man replied, he said he was a friend of yours, but I thought he was from the police. Well, you're wrong, said Jeff. Peter is a friend of mine and I hope you didn't hurt him. Peter smiled because he was pleased that Jeff remembered him. Okay, said Jeff, all of you get out. I want to talk to my old friend Peter. The others left the room and Peter and Jeff were alone. Well, Jeff, said Peter, sitting down. You haven't changed much. Perhaps not, replied Jeff, but I'm much richer now. I own this club. Peter grinned. So you've stopped stealing and started working honestly? Jeff laughed. Well, not exactly. You could say that I control the people who do the stealing. I sell the things which they steal. The club markets is very easy for me to do this because lots of people come here every day. Anyway, Peter said, 
I didn't come here for lessons about being a successful criminal. I need your help. Why? asked Jeff. Peter told Jeff the whole story that Peter had given John a lift that the police thought that John had killed his uncle but that John said that he hadn't killed him. I don't think John did kill his uncle, Peter continued. But how can we prove it? There is only one way, replied Jeff. You'll have to find the murderer. But I don't know how to start. Have you heard anyone talking about the murderer? Peter asked. No, answered Jeff. But if you can wait for a few minutes, I'll go and ask some of my friends if they know anything about it. Make yourself at home while you are waiting here. After Jeff had left, Peter got up and went out into the hall. He looked into the big room where the music was coming from. A man was singing, some girls were dancing and people were talking and laughing. It was quite dark and very hot. Peter felt thirsty. He asked for a drink and a waiter brought it. Peter tried to pay for the drink but the waiter refused to take the money. You are a friend of Jeff, the waiter said, so you don't have to pay. Ten minutes later, Jeff came back. Well, he said, as he sat down, I think I have some useful information. Peter nodded. What is it? he asked. Do you know who the murderer is? Jeff laughed. Of course not, he said. But I can give you the name of someone in Bristol who may be able to help you. What's his name? Peter asked. Bob Steele. He's a friend of mine. Bob lives by the river. He knows more about what happened in Bristol than the police do. Thank you very much, said Peter. Jeff gave Peter a piece of paper. Here's Bob's address, he said, and a note to say that you are a friend of mine. Bob will help you find the murderer. Peter stood up. Thank you again, but I must go now, he said to Jeff. I must go back to Bristol as soon as possible. Right, replied Jeff. It was nice to see you again. And if you ever want another job, come and see me. No, thank you, said Peter with a laugh. I don't think I'd be a very good thief. Jeff walked out to the door with Peter and told the man at the door to drive Peter back to his lorry in the big car. Peter got into the car and the car drove off fast down the street. So listeners, what do you think? Will Peter be able to find out the real murderer? Or do you still think that John is the killer of his uncle. Well, John is watching a film in the theatre with a girl. Will John come out of the theatre safely? Will police find him out there? Will someone else identify him there? Will Peter be able to help John to find out the real murderer? Who has killed the poor old Stevens? To find out the answers to all your questions and more, wait for the part 3 of Bristol Murder. That's it for now. Thanks. Thanks for listening. And once again, a humble request. If you have enjoyed listening this story, let others enjoy too. Share this with as many people as you can. Subscribe this and don't forget to press the bell icon. Thank you very much. See you soon with part 3 of Bristol Murder.